E. Now. Hi, I'm Buddy Bomsey. I'm Eric Carlson. I'm Nathan Huey. I'm Andrew Moronic. And today we're going to be presenting our ME 401 project, Passive Exoskeleton uh, Production and Construction. Uh, when I was a kid, I was always told to lift with my legs and not my back when shoveling snow off my driveway. Uh, this was to reduce the chances of injury to myself, especially when shoveling really heavy snow, which I think we've all been there. Um, our objective for this project is to be able to design and build a passive exoskeleton that helps reduce the strain on your body and make it cheap and affordable for everyone. The lower back exoskeleton design we made should improve the efficiency and support the user in manual labor. During our testing, we want to evaluate if the exoskeleton reduces the stress and strain on the user's body. Our timeline is pretty straightforward. Uh, we start with the IRB report, then the ES, EMG training, then the design window, material collection, um, construction of the exoskeleton, um, the EMG testing, and then finally the final report. The spacing for the timeline is around a week or two before the next task. Let me explain the final design we came up with and the mechanical concepts surrounding it. So the exoskeleton uh, consists of four major components. The elastic bands, which are placed on the knee and hip joints. When a person bends down, the elastics will stretch and produce a calendar moment, allowing the person to use less energy when standing back up. This is a primary concept that will allow the exoskeleton to assist people. When lifting a heavy object, the produced counter moment will reduce the amount of energy needed and thus reduce the stress on the muscles of the user. Uh, the pants and vest uh, being used are the main uh, body of the exoskeleton. Um, on them are Velcro straps that allow the elastics to be adjusted for each user. Uh, and they are tight fitted to prevent the elastics from moving, uh, anchoring them in um, needed places. On the vest is an exterior spine acting as a splint in the lower back. Uh, as the elastics are stretching, they're uh, producing a compressive force. And as a result, if no action is taken, the elastics could produce a compression on the spine, which can uh, be a health hazard. Um, so by incorporating this exterior spine, its rigid form prevents that compression um, from occurring on the spine. As previously mentioned, the exoskeleton is comprised of several different components. Each of these Components require several materials to be constructed. The main materials being used are tensile bands for the elastics, uh, a lifting vest for the exoskeleton vest, and a compre um, compression pants for the exoskeleton pants. All of these materials, um, as well as nylon cloth, were purchased via Amazon, costing a total of $94.77. Um, thanks to donations from Professor Fight's lab, the group was also able to obtain other needed materials to produce um, the exoskeleton for free. Um, these included Velcro pads to connect the elastics to the vest and pants, um, sewing needles, threads, and pins to attach components together and make uh, fittings to the suit, uh, PVC tubing to act as 
main supports for the exterior spine, foam noodles to uh, coat the exterior spine and make it more comfortable for the user, uh, and the Dallas EMG sensors and program to allow experimentation of the suit to be conducted. The test consisted of three main strenuous activities. These included high knees, squats, and a five kilogram lift. We began testing using a program called DELSIS, which allowed us to measure the voltage patterns when performing these exercises. We acquired voltage data from EMG sensors, which connected directly to DELSIS and gave us real-time results. Uh, these 30-second tests measuring the voltage response of the left and right latissimus dorsi and left and right vastus medialis and our test consisted of three main test subjects. The results of this experiment are time series voltage data taken during 30 second intervals while three different exercises were performed. In order to investigate the results, box and whisker plots were generated for each data set. Shown in the slide are the graphs generated for subject B. All but two of the experiments showed lower data ranges for exoskeleton use versus the unassisted uh, exercise. Lower range, lower range of voltage indicates a lower stress on the muscles which can be seen in the graphs on the slide. These results are further supported by the tables shown here based on the same data from the graphs on the previous slide. In the final column of each of the tables, you can see the ranges uh, for each uh, data set. Uh, you can see the only two instances where the exoskeleton produced higher range than the unassisted uh, exercise are highlighted in red. There are a few potential causes for this, including uh, one of the sensors being poorly positioned, uh, not well connected to the subject, or a sense of sensor malfunction. Uh, we believe this; these may have caused this because each of these instances was uh, detected using the same sensor. The data collected during this experiment anecdotally supports the conclusion that a passive exoskeleton can reduce overall muscle stress. However, in order to make any statements of significance, a higher number of tests and a more rigorous statistical analysis will be required. This data does indicate that there is merit in continuing to investigate this concept. Based on our analysis, the exoskeleton was shown to have merit, and further tests could be done with this concept to formulate a finalized design. There were minor sources of error where specific tests showed the exoskeleton making it slightly more difficult to perform these exercises, but these were simply outliers in our pool of tests. Again, these were promising results, so future tests or design iterations are highly recommended. Additionally, we'd like to thank Professor Fight and Professor Hoover for the helpful input and supplied materials. Thank you.